everybody. I hope you're doing well today. I'm just carrying on with where I left off at the last episode last week. Okay. No one except Charlie St. Cloud and his dead brother Sam. What on earth was going on? She leaped up and spun around. She grabbed her waist and then her hair. She rubbed her jeans. She rolled a button on her shirt between her fingers. Everything felt as normal as ever. And yet it wasn't. She called out to the old guys under the tree. Boney, Chum, Iggy and Dipper. But they kept on chatting. And her soul filled with dread. Something terrible must have happened. She tried to remember the boat and the storm. She could see herself capsizing, then fighting her way onto the deck after Kerosina righted herself. But then what? Had she made it back to port? Her memory was a fog. She groped around, but could grasp nothing. When did she die? The question seemed impossible. Tess felt the terror and turmoil inside. She desperately needed an anchor. Then she realised she had only one thing to do. Find Charlie. If anyone could explain what was happening, he could. But what if something had changed and now he couldn't see her, like everyone else? What if she had become invisible to him too? Anxiously, she tried to spot Charlie in the huge cemetery, but he was nowhere to be found. Finally, Tess all but threw herself on her father's grave under the ma Japanese maple. If this was death, she thought, then Dad would come to be with her, or maybe he would be waiting for her somewhere else. Where was she supposed to go? What was she to do? Was there an information desk somewhere? A bulletin board? She didn't have a clue. Then she began to cry and didn't stop until she fell asleep, exhausted. She awoke, gasping with fear that she would never find Charlie. The sky was almost dark, and as she pulled herself up from the grass, she remembered Sam's instructions. Find the blue spruce in the forest, and the trail on the, uh, on the other side of the old log. She shuddered. The woods were so creepy at night. Could she do it alone? To her surprise, the forest was peaceful and calm. She followed the path, past the waterfall and pool then threaded her way through the cypress grove. Suddenly, she heard voices up ahead and a beagle's yowl. When she came into the clearing, there was Charlie on a bench. The very sight of him lifted her spirits. At least she could be certain that part of her life was real. She just wanted him to tell her it was all some big mistake. She wanted to kiss him and start up exactly where they had left off last night. As she approached, she prayed Charlie would still be able to see her, and when he leaped up and smiled at her, she felt an incredible wave of relief. She wasn't alone anymore. She heard his deep voice. Thank God you're here. I was so afraid you were never coming back. She was impossibly beautiful. Her hair was tousled around her shoulders. Her eyes were full of feeling. Charlie stood up to hug her hello. He reached out with his arms, but she stopped short by one foot. Where have you been? She asked. I was looking all over for you. Been looking for you too, he answered. I take it you met my brother. Hi, Sam, she said. They were the two sweetest words ever. Charlie had never imagined he would hear a woman greet his brother that way. Hi, Sam said. Shame you got here so late. It's too dark to play catch. He turned to Charlie. She says she doesn't throw you like a girl. Do you believe her? Now's not the time, Charlie said. He looked at Tess. She was standing there, as real as anyone he had ever known. There wasn't a single sign that she was fading away. And yet, in his brain, he knew she would. He wondered how much she understood. He decided to start with a simple question. How are you doing? I was fine until I couldn't see my reflection in the water, she said. Now I'm just confused. Tell me what's going on, Charlie. She obviously didn't know what had happened. And he knew he would have to be the one to break the news. Come on, she said. I'm a big girl. I can handle it. She was obviously trying to be brave. But her tremulous voice gave her away. He had seen this before as spirits passed the ward's side. He ached over what she was going through. The confusion, the fear, the sadness. I'm not sure where to start, Charlie said. How about the beginning? All right, he said. Kerosina has been missing for 48 hours. The whole town is worried sick. The fleet went out to search. Missing for 48 hours? She stomped the ground. Damn, that's a long time. A fisherman found a piece of your hull off Halibut Point. Tink and I found your little your life raft in Sandy Bay. Where? Sandy Bay, off Rockport. That's strange. I wasn't anywhere near Rockport. Must have been the wind and the current. She walked over to the swing and sat down on the wood plank. Do you remember what happened? 
Sam asked. Not really, she said. Charlie watched her carefully. He hadn't missed any obvious clues. There were no telltale signs. She wasn't fading at the edges. There was no heavenly glow around her. She just seemed like herself, radiant as ever. She kicked her legs in the air and the swing began to sway. You've got to try to remember, Charlie said. We need to know where you were when it happened. Tess jumped down from the swing. Look, I know exactly what happened. The storm was force 10 and I spent the night upside down on the water. It was freezing. A damn bottle of salad dressing shattered in the galley. It stank up the whole joint. I can still smell it on me. Then what? Next thing, I was at Dad's grave. Do you remember coming back to the port? Not exactly. Do you know how you got to the cemetery? No, Chaz. It's a blur. That's okay, he said. Sometimes when it happens suddenly, you don't even realise what's going on. It takes time to sink in. He watched her carefully, weighing the impact of his words. She seemed dazed at first, and then said, Dear God, what's going to happen to me? Everything will feel better soon, he said, his voice choking on the words. And you'll realise you're going home where you belong. Home? What are you talking about? Home is on lookout court with Bobo. Home is with my mother and my friends. There were tears in her emerald eyes now. She brushed them away and tried to force a smile, but it came off a little crooked. Then she said, and I was even beginning to think home might be with you. Chapter 22 Tess wasn't a superstitious sailor. She never cared if her crew said pig, a word most marine mariners dreaded because of an obscure belief that swine could somehow see the wind and mentioning them could whip up gales. She even dared to whistle while she worked, another taboo on the water, and she never hesitated to set sail on Fridays, which for centuries had portended disaster. She often stepped onto her boat with her left foot first, and she insisted that Kerosina be painted blue, a colour associated with tragedy at sea. Now, incredibly, she wondered if it had been stupid to keep testing her luck. She had brought flowers aboard her boat, even though seamen insisted they be reserved for funerals. She had always looked back to port after sailing out, another violation of the code. Yes, she had broken the rules a thousand times or more, and Tess couldn't help thinking, maybe this was her fault. Night was falling on the forest, the moon was up and the stars were out, and Tess sat with Charlie and Sam at the picnic table in the clearing. She was trying to hold herself together. Crazy random thoughts were flooding her brain. She didn't want to unravel it in front of her, in front of them, but little by little, the reality of it was locking into her consciousness. Life was over, and she felt the bump on her head. She began to have flashes of what had really happened the night of the storm. The images struck her in fragments. She didn't have the whole picture yet, but she could see the waves overtaking her and the world going black. Deep down, she glimpsed what death meant. She would never race solo around the world. She would never sail the Strait of Malacca or the Sulu Sea. She would never see her name in the Hall of Fame in Providence. She would never walk down the aisle of the Old North Church. She would never honeymoon in Spain or run with the bulls in Pamplona. Or see the sunny, safe spot in the bull rings of Seville. She would never feel the miracle of new life kicking inside her. She would never teach her daughter how to hoist a mainsail or strike a luff curve. Worst of all, and this was what distressed her more than anything, she would never know true and lasting love. She tried to stop herself, and she never even thought about a list like this yesterday or the day before, but now it went on and on. She would never again taste the roast beef at Minnow's. She would never bundle up and play in the powder puff game on Thanksgiving. These were her rituals, the routines that made her feel alive and connected. Without them, where would she be? Lost? And there was this wonderful new man. She would never get to know this Charlie St. Cloud who appeared from nowhere in her life and instantly was snatched out of reach. Why has she met him now? God must have had a reason. She tried to concentrate on what Charlie and Sam were saying, taking turns describing the afterlife and the road ahead. They made it all sound like the most natural transition in the world. After a while, she interrupted Charlie. I need to understand how this works. How can you see me, Sam? She hesitated for a moment. And, oh, how can you see Sam? She hesitated for a moment. And how can you see me? Well, when our accident happened, Charlie explained, I crossed over too. 
It was a classic near-death experience, and when they shocked me back to life, I was graced with this gift. I could still see people in the limbo between life and death. That's where I am now. I think so, he said, but he threw me off a little. You don't really look like most spirits. I'll take that as a compliment, Tess said. Now, what about touching? How did we kiss last night, and how can I open doors and change clothes and feed Bobo? Charlie smiled. Right now, you have one foot in both worlds. You're here and not here. You're literally in between. He reached out and took her hand. Folks who die very suddenly or who don't want to let go can exert a very strong physical presence. They can do stuff like throw baseballs, drink beer or flush toilets. They're the ones who make lights flicker and things go bump in the night. How come I haven't seen any? Besides Sam, there aren't any around right now, he said. Mrs Phillips from the high school moved on this morning and I haven't seen a firefighter named Florio in a while. See, God picks when you live and die, Sam added. But when you're here in, in between, when you're here in between, you have a choice too. You can stay here as long as you want, just like me, or you can go to the next level right away. It's your call. Tess felt a wave of worry. Why hasn't my dad come to see me? She asked. I always thought he would be here waiting. Don't worry, Charlie said. He'll be there for you. But you haven't crossed over to the other side yet. I thought this was the other side. <laughs> That's what everyone thinks, Sam said. They watch John Edward on TV. They read those books about the afterlife. Everyone tells you that when you die, you see the light and you pass on. Period. The end. He smiled and lowered his voice into a whisper. It's actually more complicated. Okay, everybody, that's all I'm reading today. I really hope you've enjoyed today's episode and hopefully you'll join me again tomorrow for a new one. Bye.